Hi there. Thank you so much for tuning in today. We are going to get a little science nerdy today because we're going to be talking about a topic that is still in clinical trial. There is not yet anything that has been released or launched specifically to help with this condition that we're about to talk about, but it's a really exciting area of research. And I think everyone with multiple sclerosis should know that it's happening. And what that is, is remyelination. So we are going to dive into what remyelination is and why that's important in the first place. And then we're also going to dive into what is required because remyelination, once we get into it, you might feel like, well, that just sounds too good to be true. And so I think it's really important that we discuss what is required, like what do we actually need in order to remyelinate? And then I'm just briefly going to touch on a few therapies that are currently in clinical trial to hopefully help with remyelination. So before we get into what remyelination is, I just want to quickly remind you, bring to the front of your brain, that with multiple sclerosis, it is a demyelinating disease, meaning the myelin that we have around our axons in our neural pathways is withering away. It's deteriorating. And that is what causes a lot of symptoms of multiple sclerosis, like weakness, difficulty walking, poor balance, difficulty doing day-to-day -day things, day-to-day -day functions, like standing while cooking dinner, climbing stairs, getting dressed, showering, you name it. Therefore, if we could stop the demyelination from happening, and then also remyelinate, which basically means bringing back more myelin. So all that myelin that had withered away, we're trying to find a way in research to bring it back, to restore it. And so with multiple sclerosis, and honestly, any demyelinating disease like transverse myelitis, neuromyelitis optica, any of those, any demyelinating disease would benefit from remyelination because it essentially builds up the thing that we're losing with a demyelinating disease. So there are three things that remyelination would do for people with demyelinating diseases. The first thing is that it would restore the conduction of the impulses along the neural pathways. So essentially what I mean by that is we all have trillions of neural pathways starting at our brain and then they travel down our spinal cord and then they go to each individual muscle in our body. And that's how our muscles work. Anytime a muscle moves or activates and functions, first, our brain has to send a message saying, lift your leg or lift your ankle, do X, Y, Z. And then that message travels all the way down those tons and tons and tons of neural pathways. And then it gets to the muscle and then the muscle moves. But when you have a demyelinating disease, that myelin that helps with that traveling down the neural pathways isn't there, or at least it's not fully there. So that often results in the message not getting from your brain down to your muscle. And this firsthand, if you've experienced a situation or maybe many situations where you tell yourself, okay, lift my leg, lift it up off of the ground, or lift my ankle up, lift my toes up, or reach forward. And you're telling yourself to do that, but it's just not physically happening. The reason for that when you have a demyelinating disease is because your neural pathways aren't getting the message to your muscles. Sometimes it is misperceived as weakness, and that's why the muscle is not working, but that's only a secondary result. It's actually due to the neural pathway not acting as it should due to the demyelination. So if we are able to remyelinate, that would restore the conduction of those neural pathways. So those pathways that were not working well, theoretically, would be restored. 
Additionally, remyelination therapies would hopefully protect the axons and the neural pathways from damage in the future. So it not only would bring more myelin and restore the neural pathways, but ideally protect them from further damage. Lastly, the third thing that we are hoping that remyelination therapies would help with is recovery of previously lost function. So if you have had multiple sclerosis or any demyelinating disease for five years, 10 years, 20 years, doesn't really matter how long you've had it, but if one of the symptoms has been weakness that has resulted in you not being able to bend your knee, one goal of remyelination is that you would now be able to bend your knee. It would recover function that was previously lost. And what I mean by function is movements in our body. Now, I should share that remyelination trials are currently going on, and they have found success in mice and cats. So definitely not the same thing as humans, but in the studies that have used mice and rats with remyelination therapies, they were successful. They were able to remyelinate, which is really exciting. And not only that, but they were able to see on a cellular level that the myelin, the new myelin that was formed was thinner than the original myelin, but it was still functional. So if you picture like a big, thick marshmallow, for some reason, when I think of myelin, I think of marshmallows. <laughs> so if you picture a big, nice, thick marshmallow, that might be what normal myelin would represent. But then if we picture, maybe maybe we're at a bonfire and we're roasting marshmallows and it's getting thinner and thinner and more liquidy, that might be what remyelinated myelin represents. So same thing, it is remyelinating, but it's just not as thick and plump and nice as the original myelin. But regardless, it was still functional. It did still have improvements. And more specifically, they found that cats that had demyelinated optic nerves, meaning they had some type of vision loss due to their optic nerves being demyelinated, they were able to recover their vision through remyelination. And not only that, but they found that this remyelination was able to occur alongside demyelination, which is really fantastic because what that essentially means is that we don't necessarily need to cure multiple sclerosis. Like we don't need to stop it in its tracks in order to then remyelinate. They can both be happening at the same time. Now in an ideal world, do we want to stop MS and the demyelination? Absolutely, 100%. But it's nice to know that we might be able to find a remyelination therapy that doesn't require demyelination to have previously stopped in order for it to be effective. So I want to dive more into what is required in our bodies in order to remyelinate. And I'm going to stay away from all medical terminology just so that it's easier to understand. And before we get into the three or four things that's required, it's important that we are first aware of some cells and proteins that are in our bodies. So the first type of cells that we have in our bodies are cells that make myelin. And as you may guess, when you have multiple sclerosis or another demyelinating disease, those cells are limited. We are not making more myelin at the rate that we need to. And therefore that is limiting the ability for us to have this recovery. So one type of cell is those cells that make myelin. Keep that in the back of your mind. The second thing that I want you to be aware of is that there is a protein in our bodies and this protein occurs when you have a demyelinating disease. Researchers think that this specific type of protein is actually potentially what inhibits or prevents remyelination or the creation of these cells that make myelin. So as you may guess, we want more of the cells that make myelin and we want to get rid 
of those proteins that are inhibiting that myelin. Another thing to consider is what the microenvironment is in our brain and spinal cord, really in our central nervous system. Because if we do have more myelin, more cells that make myelin, and we get rid of the proteins that inhibit more myelin cells of creating more myelin, it only will work if we have the right micro environment. So I like to think of this as if we are living in a desert. So picture yourself in a desert right now and you just don't see any greenery anywhere. It is just all sand. It's really hot. You're sweating. And if you have MS, you're probably experiencing heat intolerance right now. So we're picturing the desert, right? But let's say you just got to the desert, you flew in, and with you, you brought a little plant, and you're hoping this plant will grow. And you have all the things with you that you need for it to grow. You brought water, you brought the seeds, you brought soil. Of course, there's going to be sun there. Maybe you even brought some shade. So you dig a hole, you plant your plant, you water it, you give it some shade and it still has some light as well. All the things that would be successful in a different environment. But the truth is that plant is probably not going to grow, not because you didn't do everything you could to keep it alive, but because the micro environment, the environment around it, that desert is not conducive to it. And the same thing goes for our brain. We need to make sure that our brain and our spinal cord, our entire central nervous system has a micro environment that is conducive to the growth of these cells that will create more myelin. Otherwise, we'll get these cells, but then nothing will happen because our environment in our central nervous system isn't conducive to that and it won't make a difference. So let's move on to exactly what we need in order to remyelinate. And we've already been touching on this for the last few minutes, but I just wanna make it super clear. So there are three things that we need in order to remyelinate. Number one, we need a therapy that allows the creation of more cells that make myelin. Number two, we need to move those cells around. If we get a bunch of cells that make myelin, but they're only landing in one area, well then that might not benefit us for in our total body it might only benefit us in certain functions or certain areas so once we get those cells that make myelin we want to mobilize them so that they go throughout our whole body and then thirdly we want to improve the lesion micro environment and what i mean by that is improve the micro environment of the central nervous system so fortunately we do have some information based on research of how we can do each of these things and by the way where i'm getting this information from is the updates that i received at the annual ms consortium from 2021 and 2023. So the first thing was to get more cells that make myelin. And in order to do that, it likely will be a therapy. Our bodies probably won't be doing that on their own. And so the drugs that have been found in mice to be successful at this, and by the way, I should preface this by saying, I am not recommending that anyone try any of these medications. I'm just sharing with you what research has found. If you are interested in looking into any of these things, please talk to your neurologist, your primary care physicians, people who know more about this. But what I'm talking about was in mice and in cats, not in humans. So we have found, researchers have found that to stimulate the growth of those cells that make myelin, the drugs that have been able to do that in mice are benztropine, clemestine, clobetasol, mycanazole, and metformin. And some of these are being tested in human studies. I will say clemestine has already been tested, and I believe that one did not help in humans, but that's what they found in mice. The second thing that we needed was mobilization of these cells that make myelin. And one thing that researchers have found that can help mobilize these cells throughout our whole body is exercise, which I thought was a really exciting update because exercise, I truly believe, is something that we can all do. And what they found was that exercise not only can help move the cells around, the cells that make myelin, but it increases oligodendrogenesis 
And I know I said I wouldn't use any medical or big words, but basically what that means is the creation of these cells that we need to make more myelin. Exercise increases that even after demyelination. So everyone with MS or a demyelinating disease right now has demyelination, or I shouldn't say everyone, but the majority of people. So researchers have shown that exercise is something that can help with the process of making more myelin and mobilizing that myelin throughout your body, even after demyelination has occurred. And one more thing about exercise is that these researchers found that exercise promotes remyelination, and they were actually able to see that on a cellular level in the clinical studies, which I thought was really fascinating. The third thing that I mentioned that we need in order to remyelinate is improving our lesion microenvironment. Remember, we don't want a desert. We want an, an environment that's going to be conducive to the growth of this myelin. And there are actually two ways that we can do this. The first is by reducing those proteins that inhibit or prevent the new cells of making myelin. One medication that is currently being researched that they're hoping will improve this is fluorosamine. And the second way that we can improve our lesion microenvironment is through modulating and reducing inflammation in our body and specifically in our brain and spinal cord and central nervous system. So one way that we are attempting to do that right now is through disease modifying therapies, but there are other ways as well. Now, I just want to touch on two more things that are more medication based that might help with remyelination. And again, these are things that have not been tested in humans yet. They're not FDA approved. I just want you to be aware of them. So one medication that they were sharing at this conference that I was at that has been shown to be the most promising repurposed medication for progressive MS, and it promotes the creation of the cells that make myelin, it promotes remyelination, and neuroprotection is niacin. And niacin is a pretty common drug. I don't have any more information on what the dose was or frequency, duration. They didn't share that. They were just sharing that niacin is something that they have seen potential with, and they're hoping that it would move forward in human trials as well. And the last medication I wanted to briefly discuss, I'm sure I will have another episode fully on this, is BTK inhibitors. So BTK inhibitors are a class of drug. I was about to say a new class of drug. They're not new. They're new for multiple sclerosis, but they've been used for a while in other diseases and in other communities, specifically in chemotherapy. And BTK inhibitors stands for Bruton's tyrosine kinase. And there's a lot of excitement around BTK inhibitors used as a disease-modifying therapy in multiple sclerosis because most disease-modifying therapies that currently exist only affect the adaptive immune system, which are the B cells, but BTK inhibitors affect the innate immune system as well, and it means that it can go into and beyond in and out of the blood-brain barrier, and it can go into the brain. As of right now, we do not have any other disease-modifying therapies that do that. So the fact that BTK inhibitors can affect the functions of our innate and adaptive immune cells is a big differentiating factor that we're hoping will bring success. Now, there are some clinical trials going on right now with BTK inhibitors for people with multiple sclerosis, and there are three in particular that a lot of people have their eyes out for, myself included, and one of those actually released their final data in December of 2023, so not too long ago, and they found that it actually was not as effective as they thought it would be, and the medication that they were comparing it to, which was Albagio, was actually more effective than this. So to be quite honest, a lot of us were really surprised and bummed, disappointed, but there are still several other trials going on. We're hoping that we'll have more results on those within the next year to three years. 
one in particular should be releasing their data by the, I would say the very end of 2024. So again, I will have another episode fully on BTK inhibitors just to give you more details. But the reason why I wanted to mention that in this episode is because there is some hope that BTK inhibitors would reduce the inflammation in our brain, creating a more positive microenvironment for our central nervous system, therefore additionally helping with remyelination. At the end of the day, once there is a remyelination therapy that exists, it's my best guess, and with the neurologist that I've talked to, they've agreed that it likely is going to be several different things that you would be taking. It wouldn't just be, here's your one medication to remyelinate and you're good to go, but it would be more of a cocktail of things, right? So you might have a medication for remyelination, and then you might also have a medication for maybe a disease modifying therapy or something to reduce the inflammation. And then we might have a different medication to improve the lesion microenvironment. But we don't know yet. We won't know until we have more data, but it is being heavily researched and it is an area of study that I think is really exciting and interesting and can provide hope. I, of course, will keep you posted on all of this. And the last thing that I'll leave you with for today is to remember that one thing that we can do to help with this whole process of remyelination is exercise. According to researchers, the more we're moving our bodies, even if that is in a seated position, it doesn't have to mean you go run a marathon, but the more we move our bodies, the more we exercise, the more likely that will help with moving around the cells that make myelin once we do have them. So I'm a huge advocate for being proactive. Start now. If you're not moving in some way, shape, or form, figure out a way that feels doable and accessible and approachable for you and get started now. That way, if there is a remyelination therapy in the future, you've already got part of it in the bag. You know, you've already, you're already exercising. You don't have to focus on adding a ton of new things to your routine because you've already got that one thing down. So I hope that you found this informative. Hopefully you find it hopeful. I know we don't have any answers yet, but I hope that you feel informed. 